So hello everyone and welcome back to the third edition of the Typo 3 Online Days 2021. The last few sessions and the last few events basically was something amazing, at least for me. Don't know about you, let us know in the comments. Um, we're having a huge lineup of speakers today um, and it starts with uh, Timek who will tell us a lot about um, progressive web apps and headless CMS, so I'm really, really curious um, about the latest status there. Um, as usual, even if it's just an online event like we do have it now, it wouldn't be possible without our sponsors. So huge shout out to everybody who helped made all this possible. Also a big shout out to the team behind the cameras. Um, and as a starter for the first session, as I already mentioned, it's going to be Timek, who has done a lot of work in, uh, in making Typo3 work in a headless manner, um, which means that there's JavaScript going on and all the data is being fetched from APIs, which are provided by Typo3. But I definitely can say that Timek will do a much better job than I can explaining all those things. So Timek will be right up after this segue to our sponsors. So enjoy. Hello everybody and welcome to the Type of Free Online Days. I'm really happy and honored that I can be with you today. I will take uh, you through a little journey through a Type of Free headless uh, topics around um, headless and PWA applications. Ready? Let's start. The headless and, and PWA is a really hot topic recently and um, in the first part of the presentation, I will go through it. Uh, then I will share a little bit, a little bit details around the features. Uh, then we will jump to the uh, case studies. And uh, at the end, we will have a um, nice 10-minute uh, long Q&A sessions. So please prepare yourself. Uh, you can ask questions during the presentation and at the end uh, on the YouTube, in a YouTube channel, chat, or use hashtag on a social media. I'm Mateusz Motylewski, CTO of Macopedia, and uh, I'm also leading Type of Free uh, Headless Initiatives and was involved in a, in a Type of Free as a core contributor uh, for quite some years. Um, however, today we'll be talking less about me 
but um, more about the new uh, solutions and, and new experiences um, for our customers. Uh, how all did all start? Um, some years ago, um, we saw that the, the traditional CMSs and the, and the needs of the customers are um, going away from each other. And we found that we need to um, fix this gap, to fill this gap, um, and fill this missing piece. Um, around that time, the, the new keyword uh, emerged in, the, in our market, which was a, a digital experience platform, uh, DXP. And um, we found out that type of free covers most of the uh, of the features which are expected in the in the modern modern web and uh, with the mm, DXP. However, there were some some missing missing puzzles. Uh, we started investigating in, in uh, more uh, with our customers and um, identified identified few key. Uh, things we would like to uh, to fill. One of them was the content API and uh, the ability to easily integrate typo free with external systems. So how how does it uh, work? Um, if you are familiar with typo free or any other traditional CMS, uh, you know that um, both the the content um, and the presentation is managed in one system. So in traditional CMS, you have a, a single panel where uh, your editors and marketers can log in and, and create content. And this application is, is delivering the website to the end customers. So we, we have a, a traditional, uh, a, a single channel called, uh, which is a, your website, your, your, your customer portal. Uh, then for any other channels uh, like uh, mobile app, e-commerce, we would have an, another system, another um, backend system which uh, contains uh, content and uh, present the content to the, to the end users. Uh, with the headless approach, um, landscape, landscape is, is uh, different. We have a central place uh, which serves as a content repository where you put all the content you will use in different channels. And then you have uh, certain endpoints which are uh, just rendering and uh, representing visually uh, the content provided by the, by the headless uh, CMS. And those channels, of course, differ from, uh, from one customer to another, from need to need. And it could be an e-commerce, it could be a mobile application, it could be a, a website. And um, with our with type of free initiative, type of free headless initiative, we have uh, built a, a solution which uh, fills this 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 gap. So um, it consists of two main parts. First is the headless content API, uh, which is a type of free extension and and uh, and which also supports many other type of free extensions. I will talk about that later. Uh, in the presentation, and then, uh, and then we have uh, um, headless uh, PWA front, uh, which is a JavaScript application rendering the, uh, the data, the content uh, data coming from mm, headless API. Um, using this approach, uh, you are not limited, of course, to, to any uh, any theme. You can build your own styling, you, your own theme according to your uh, to your business need, to your uh, corporate identity. Uh, so this is this way. Uh, we build it in a in a way you can theme the the whole front end yourself. And this JavaScript application uh, we see on the slide on the on the middle is rendering the the final HTML, which is delivered to the browser to the user. Um, and when talking about uh, headless and um, um, we are most of the time talking about the the left part, so on the on about just the API which is uh, providing content. However, um, our customers 
mostly don't use API directly, but they have to see some visual representation. Uh, this is where you either need to consume this, this uh, headless API using some third party software like um, providing uh, content to, to your e-commerce website and presenting the visual uh, there, or you can use the PWA front we provided to render the website uh, yourself. You may ask what might be the most important benefits of going this uh, approach, and uh, I have provided a short list of uh, five benefits I, I see the most uh, important when, when talking about um, headless approach. So first of all, uh, we have a single source of, of content, sing single content repository uh, when we have content stored in a structured way. So it can be reused over multiple channels. This way, uh, the type of free becomes a, a part in the omnichannel solution delivering content to, to different uh, endpoints. And this is one of the mm, common use case for the, for the headless, where type of free delivers uh, data for, for different uh, endpoints. Um, the, the second um, common use case is slightly different. Uh, in, in this case, type of free headless uh, becomes one of the microservices uh, which all delivers uh, content, different type of content, and those endpoints, those, those services are bound together in a single experience, in a single um, web page using the um, PWA front application uh, we, are, we are providing. So you can use either the first approach where the headless uh, type of free is delivering content to multiple channels, or uh, use the, the front end application to combine data from different uh, different services. Of course, if you like, you can also uh, combine those two approaches uh, and um, it all, de all depends on, on your needs. The next really important topic and, uh, and the topic which uh, sometimes is quite con controversial uh, on, on the web is uh, performance. Uh, using the uh, type of free headless and the uh, PWA front, you can make your website really, really fast. This is mm, on one hand because we uh, put a lot of um, pressure on the, on the performance, uh, starting from the first line of code, uh, but also because of the architecture. The um, PWA front is, is uh, exchanging much less data with the uh, headless API uh, in comparison to the normal HTML, uh, HTML page. This also opens you a lot of possibilities around the PWA capabilities. Uh, for example, it's much easier with, with uh, PWA front to build um, offline page because you, you just, uh, you have raw data you can cache and uh, you don't have to uh, as the full HTML. Another topic which is uh, a benefit which is very important while choosing the, the, the correct solution uh, is that type of headless is already a, a proven and mature. Um, it's, uh, it has already three years uh, on the market and uh, I probably should take a birthday cake today uh, to, to celebrate this uh, anniversary. We, have, we had 15 releases and uh, a lot of external contributors and the whole idea um, and uh, code is uh, being fostered by the uh, type of free, uh, official type of free initiative. Um, on top of that, there are multiple agencies which are using type of free headless um, on their, uh, for, for their projects for the customers. Those uh, companies are, are just uh, the most active, uh, the one which, uh, which also contribute to the, um, to the type of free headless. So thank you guys for that and uh, looking forward for more. That's not all. 
uh, a little announcement and spoiler alert. Uh, in autumn, we would like to start uh, a um, partner program for agencies to ensure the, uh, that the agencies which, which uh, wants to provide a, a high quality headless solutions for type of free customers um, can share experience and work together uh, on making the, our, our beloved customers most happy. And the last uh, but not least, uh, the headless solution um, which is already um, provided by us is feature reach. You have um, all the features uh, you love in type of free uh, already supported. Mm, for example, you use the same type of free backend. You don't need to train editors um, in, in, in any, uh, with any aspect. Uh, you can uh, use uh, multilingual, uh, multi-domain support in type of free. Uh, and what is also important when building a website or migrating uh, is that you don't have to migrate content um, if you have content already in type of free. So you, you can reuse the content in a headless way and just build a new uh, headless uh, PWA theme on top of that content. If you want to go uh, in a more evolutionary way, you can have some domains, some, some website running, um, <coughs> uh, running headless and some of them uh, running traditional way. But uh, that's not all. We have um, many more features uh, for you. So talking about uh, routing and URLs, this is uh, all uh, the same as, uh, as in the standard type of free. You manage routing inside type of free instance, so you don't have to, uh, to bother. Uh, we also respect the uh, permissions and content visibility while rendering the, um, the API uh, and taking, of course, into account the language and uh, uh, file box or, or, or translations. Then, um, I will not go through all the, all the expressions which are already supported with, with uh, headless, but as you can see, uh, we got most uh, popular one already covered. This includes the news, um, uh, the grid elements, login, uh, solar, and, and many, many more. Um, talking about uh, the, the benefits of having headless and uh, all the great features which are already there uh, for you. I think it's uh, also important to, to, to be frank and, um, and state it clearly that um, the headless approach is, is great, but as any other tool, it's, uh, you have to know when to use it and, and when uh, to use something else, to, to make a good uh, business decisions depending on your case. Um, let's jump a little bit uh, deeper. So first of all, if you are, we are talking about uh, the challenges, um, using the headless approach and, and WA JavaScript app, which is uh, on front of, of it, you will definitely have uh, more maintenance and, uh, uh, and, and uh, separate deployment. Basically, you have two applications uh, instead of one uh, in the traditional approach. Um, this approach also requires um, a strong JavaScript competences uh, from the vendor. So, um, well, bu when building a, a new portal using this approach, it would be important to, uh, to check that. Um, also, some of the, of the customers uh, are interested in the, in the uh, headless solutions because they want to have a PWA application. Uh, but sometimes mm, it's uh, much easier and, and, and better to build um, PWA capabilities 
inside the existing traditional website. It is also possible. It is harder uh, than uh, in, in comparison to the uh, headless and, and, uh, and JavaScript application, but it's still, still uh, possible. Um, having all the, all the challenges in mind, uh, I have uh, collected some of the um, questions, some of the uh, things you should consider when ma making a, a business decision whether to use, uh, whether to go headless or, or go in a, in a traditional way uh, with, your, with your new CMS implementation. And um, I'm really interested in, in uh, whether this will be helpful for you uh, then just uh, leave a comment or, or, or contact me. Um, so what I would consider uh, when consulting a customer, uh, I would uh, definitely ask about whether they are planning to use a um, mobile application or they may be have uh, already a native mobile application and whether this application can be solved uh, using a, a PWA app. If, if the answer is yes, then uh, going into headless might be a pretty good um, solution for them. Uh, the, the other aspect is how the content is used. And uh, as I said before, the headless approach is, is uh, really shines when you reuse the content in, in the omnichannel environment. When you push the content to the, to the different, um, uh, different systems like e-commerce, IoT, um, CMS pages, and so forth. Um, another aspect is um, how often the, the website design changes and, and how uh, flexible uh, you need to be on, on the changes. Uh, because uh, the separation of, of data and, um, and visualization headless brings uh, gives the benefit of, of being able to change the, the visual part without affecting the uh, API and the backend. And uh, so this approach um, is uh, really useful when you, you would like to have a uh, clear separation of the of the duties in that part and um, change your layout, change your design uh, quite often. Um, another another um, uh, solution which uh, which is also worth considering is whether the um, you're planning to have a, a single um, application or a single website which is binding together multiple services like uh, having a common uh, UX for both CMS and e-commerce, um, some loyalty program, a profile page for the users, and, and more. If, uh, if this is true, then also a headless approach might be a good fit. Mm, another, another thing is, is uh, a speed. If a speed is top priority, then definitely you should consider the um, consider the um, headless approach and uh, WA capabilities, which are much easier to implement, much easier to use in a uh, in a JavaScript world, in a JavaScript application than in a traditional um, traditional CMS. Let me know in the questions or comments if uh, maybe I miss a thing here. Um, and uh, now let's switch to uh, to the future and uh, show show what we are still planning. Uh, so let's talk roadmap. The first thing we we are planning to um, to work on in the in the and release in the next month uh, is a um, type of free theme. Um, th our goal is to, uh, to lower the barrier and uh, make people and agencies uh, life much easier when implementing new websites uh, using type of free headless and PWA front. So we will provide a, um, a library of components uh, with 
um, default styles you can you can reuse uh, to build uh, uh, faster websites uh, as well as this uh, demo will serve uh, as a, a best practice example um, to, to learn from another big um, stone on our roadmap is um, becoming a verified expression you might know the, the term from uh, the recent talk from uh, Felker from the previous uh, type of free uh, days uh, in uh, June um, so type of free will become verified extensions really really soon we are finishing some last uh, some last uh, mm, stroke and what does it mean uh, to the to the to you to to the end users so first of all we will um, promise that we will support two LTS versions uh, to ease the migration, ease the upgrades between LTS releases. Uh, we are also finishing the uh, compat compatibility with version 11 of the, of the solution. As well as um, we'll improve documentation and, and um, some other smaller uh, features. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, from the product part, this is um, this is it. And I would like to take you now to um, the real life case studies I have prepared for you. So as I uh, mentioned uh, before, the type of free headless is already used on production in, in uh, on the enterprise scale with um, international customers. Well, as well with with some uh, smaller websites, uh, but uh, those cases shows the the real real power of the of the solution. First case I would like to um, show is uh, Robin Group company. This uh, um, logistic leader in Europe. Uh, you probably saw their their trucks running uh, around uh, the cities on the highways. Uh, if, if you are in, uh, in Europe and, and uh, yeah, uh, with the big red uh, logo. Um, here, the, the Raban is uh, our customers since uh, almost 10 years. And the recent, um, uh, the recent uh, changes to the website and the recent upgrade uh, was also connected with moving the portal to a type of free headlet and uh, a PWA front. Uh, the website has uh, 13 domains, 16 languages, and it's integrated with multiple uh, APIs. Basically, it helps uh, uh, both the end customers as well as um, uh, companies and truck drivers to, uh, to, to deliver the, the logistics packages. Um, the next uh, case I would like to show is um, the, the case which, which uh, um, gives a really nice um, overview of the power of the type of free and type of free headless. Um, for the uh, multi-sport card users, we have created a digital experience platform based on type of free and type of free headless. Uh, the platform is uh, is used by over a million of users. Mm, it is an omnichannel platform which supports and delivers content to uh, to, to uh, mobile application to uh, connects with e-identity, uh, but also with, with gamification portals uh, and provides a lot of features to to uh, registered users like podcasts, audiobooks. Um, diet creators and, and even online trainings, uh, live online trainings with, uh, with a personal trainer. Uh, on the technical level, uh, we have a plenty of integrations uh, with, with uh, uh, different APIs, uh, as well as uh, calendar and even check-in registration, uh, user data, GDPR, APIs and, and many, many more. 
all that that uh, that APIs, all that content is uh, bound together in a single UX uh, and um, delivered as as a single uh, user experience to to all the users. And the last uh, case I would like to show is the Macmillan application. Mm, this, if, if you are not a native uh, English speaker, then you definitely know this brand and, and uh, probably used some of their um, guidebooks to, to uh, learn English. Uh, so this was really cool to work with the customer, with the brand we know, uh, yeah, even from the primary school. Uh, and in this uh, website, we moved away content from uh, multiple old CMSs, custom custom made to the type of free. Uh, so the user has uh, again a common experience when when browsing the uh, the data, the content. We have a product catalog. Um, we have personalization of of the catalog uh, depending on on the your uh, user data and your preferences as well as integration with um, uh, marketing automation tools. But it's also worth mentioning we have 120 regions here. Uh, so this website is really, really global. And uh, what is most important here, um, we have yet another happy customer, uh, which is what, f what is worth at the end of the day. I hope I uh, get you at least a little bit interested in, in the headless and PWA solution for type of free. Uh, so you might ask uh, how to learn more and where to go to, to, um, to learn more, more about the solution. I have a few links for you. So first is uh, uh, the type of free headless website. It's uh, tfreepwa.com. Uh, you will find all the important information in the links here. And if you are uh, also interested in the technical details, then please head to uh, GitHub. You will find the, uh, the type of free uh, headless extension code base. Um, and of course, uh, you can also contribute back to the, uh, to the system. Um, I haven't mentioned that before, but uh, I think it's really important to highlight that this solution is uh, and, the, and the ecosystem is 100 open, open source, uh, so you can use it, uh, modify, and uh, hopefully contribute back to the uh, to it. Um, any solution would not be complete uh, if there were. Uh, no services and, and support around that. So we also have that covered. If you are in need for the uh, consulting or, or support in your um, PWA implementation or, uh, uh, or w are wondering whether to use this, whether this suits your needs or not, then just uh, head to the t3pwa.com and uh, uh, use the, the contact form at the, at the bottom. So right now, um, let's switch uh, to the uh, most impor important part of the talk. So a QA session, Q and A session. Uh, as, as I said at the beginning, you can ask questions directly on YouTube uh, or use uh, hashtag on social media. Um, I think mm, we'll have uh, a few questions in a moment. And uh, if you got any more questions or would like to uh, contact me directly um, or give feedback about this presentation, don't hesitate to, to use the contact details um, shown on the, on the video. Okay, uh, I think we have the first question. Let me check it. What are the most 
business benefits of a PWA implementation. Um, let's let's take um, the question asked about a PWA. So it, it, I'm not sure whether um, it also asked about the, the headless part, but uh, let's, for the sake of the of the shorter answer, uh, let's let's uh, stick to the PWA part. Um, so the um, there are all, all, uh, over 100 uh, different capabilities um, which are bound together in a single uh, term called PWA. So uh, you cannot use all of them in a single web page or a single application. So um, it, it's important to know that under this term PWA there, there are many capabilities uh, which, you know, until some years ago were only available in a mobile, uh, native mobile applications. Uh, just to name a few, um, offline browsing uh, or full screen mode on the mobile uh, screens. Mm -hmm. uh, access to the, to the native uh, mobile APIs like, you know, camera, uh, file browser and, and storages. So depending on your use case, there are plenty of um, plenty of APIs you could incorporate in your website and uh, I think the most important one or the and, and the mostly used uh, is uh, the API which allows you to um, add the offline mode to your uh, web page this way when using the mobile uh, version of the PWA version of the uh, of the website and you lost connection in a, in a train or uh, elevator, you, you don't get a blank white page, but uh, the website is still working and you can uh, see the content which is already cached uh, on your phone uh, or just uh, wait for the connection to, mm, to be established to, to continue uh, using the website. This way you, you don't lose the, uh, you don't lose the mm, visitor uh, but you keep him engaged and, and uh, also he, he does not lose the, the work. For example, if you send a, a form uh, with online mode enabled, you can uh, store the form data and send it when the network is uh, reestablished. Let's uh, check the second question. Um, what is required to create a type of free Vue.js application? Is it type of free and uh, extension headless API, extension Vue.js theme, uh, and template extension or specific Vue.js uh, for the customer? Mm. So um, this question goes a little bit into, um, into technical things. Um, we have uh, recorded a webinar about uh, the technical details and um, just reach out to me, I can share the link. Uh, however, to, to answer the question, um, basically we have, uh, we have you covered with uh, the full solution. So starting from the API, uh, starting from compatibility with common extension on a type of free site. Then we have a, um, a Vue.js uh, Nuxt application which is called uh, on, on GitHub, I believe, Nuxt Type of Free, which uh, is responsible for communicating with Type of Free headless API and also provides a, a basic unstyled component uh, for the, all the default Type of Free content elements. On top of that, you need to create your own mm, styling uh, and, and uh, theme for, for the uh, components we deliver. And this basically is, uh, gives you a, a working website. Mm. On the type of free um, initiative page uh, and the GitHub, repos uh, GitHub uh, repository, you will also find links to a, a repository which helps you to kickstart a new project or uh, run a local demo uh, with a demo theme of, of a type of free headless and PWA um, on your machine. This, this way you can uh, check it out um, uh, easily. 
let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, and we have uh, another question. Mm -hmm. What about custom XBase forms used to create edit XBase models? Is there an easy way to configure that uh, without touching models and validators? Uh, can we s find some examples somewhere? Um, so uh, yes, it is possible. Um, for example, we, we are supporting the news extension which is built, um, built in, in XBase. Uh, and in order to avoid uh, rewriting of, of, the old, of the news um, accession controllers, um, we uh, went into a way that um, uh, we provide a, a, set, of, um, a set of templates which, which uh, returns a JSON instead of uh, instead of uh, HTML. And this way we make the news extension and the XBase extension uh, compatible with um, headless approach without the need to rewrite the extension itself. However, if, if you are um, building the XBase extension from scratch, I would not go this direction, but I would uh, uh, return the, the API and the JSON response directly from the, from the controllers. Um, you have. So th there are samples and uh, we have um, uh, support from, for both um, type of rebuilt in form accession as well as, as, well as power mail um, where you can see examples how to handle forms and, and receive data uh, from JavaScript application uh, into the type of free. The next question is, uh, how is the routing solved? Um, I believe that this question goes into the topic around, um, uh, let's say, nice URLs or the, or the, um, um, or the slacks or, or however you call it. So uh, when building a, a headless uh, solution, mm, we... Um, we could go into two directions. One was to um, uh, to leave the URL management on a type of free site and uh, teach the JavaScript, JavaScript application um, how to con integrate with type of free and how to um, use the URLs which are delivered by type of free and managed in type of free. Uh, and this is the way we went. Uh, alternatively, uh, we could um, just leave the routing to the JavaScript, JavaScript application, and uh, as, uh, as it, uh, this is uh, like it's done in the most of the uh, headless solutions for other CMSs uh, out there. Uh, so the JavaScript application takes over routing and uh, just uses the uh, headless CMS as a, uh, let's say, uh, just an API for, for uh, data, but the whole uh, URL routing is handled in the JavaScript application. We didn't want to go this way. Uh, we wanted the editors to have a full control over the URLs and the uh, speaking names of the pages as they have in a traditional implementation of type of free. Uh, so uh, the routing is still uh, being resolved by type of free. And the last question, because we are running out of the time. Mm. And the last question is, would you recommend to use a uh, storybook? Um, uh, well, yes, I would recommend using uh, any tool for uh, creating a, a, let's say a catalog of the front-end components. Um, so you are able to present them, to test them, to check how do they work in a, in a different conditions. Uh, and we have a solution like that in a, in a uh, type of free um, you know, PWA front um, already in. So all the components we create 
and uh, all the components uh, you use and create and style in your um, implementation uh, can be presented and tested in a, uh, in a, in a storybook or, or something similar. I think that uh, we got r run out, out of the time. So um, if you have any more questions, then uh, just uh, drop me a line. And uh, I'm really happy that there were so many questions. Uh, I hope this uh, presentation was helpful for you. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, see you. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. I didn't promise too much, did I? I did see that there were a couple of questions coming still, but you know, we got to stick to to a schedule because our next speaker is already up and waiting. Um, I'm pretty sure Timek will hang around. Other than that, you will find him on Slack or by other channels um, that he gave you to get in contact with them. And I do know that Timek and his entire team are very, very uh, eager to help everyone, and uh, I just love you guys. Um, as for our next speaker, it's about cloud hosting. And uh, AWS obviously being one of the biggest players in cloud hosting, if not the biggest player, um, we have Root360, um, which is a cloud hosting provider and uh, solution architectural company that will help you actually um, develop your system and set it up the right way. And Timo will talk us uh, through the benefits of uh, moving your Type 3 installation onto AWS Cloud Services, as well as looking into some of the nitty-gritty details, like how do you migrate your data, how do you, how do you set the base system up, and how do you secure that system. Um, and I'm really keen to see that session, so we'll head on over. Timo, take it away.
Hello everybody, my name is Timo and I will take you on the next journey to Typo 3 on AWS. I will give you a technical overview on migration maintenance, performance and security. I am working at Roots 360 as a cloud architect uh, for several years and um, at uh, the end of July Roots 360 became a part of scaling. Um, which, is, uh, which is the merger of five cloud companies and has now over five, 450 employees. And um, we are doing AWS and Azure Cloud and we have eight locations of our offices in Germany, Brazil and Romania. Okay, let's start. At the first, uh, we will start with a single server in the cloud, um, which is not very um, special. Then we are going to um, go to the decoupled components, then we are switching to auto scaling, and then we are um, showing, um, then we are uh, seeing an enterprise architecture um, for type of three, and then we do some security in the cloud, and at the end um, we will talk about the costs of AWS. Um, the presentation is based on um, the five pillars of AWS, um, which are called the operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, efficiency, and cost optimization. So we will start with an EC2 single instance, and then we end uh, at the final um, with an enterprise architecture setup um, with the most benefits from the AWS cloud. So let's start with an EC2 instance. Um, the EC2 instance um, is, a, is a simple way to migrate an existing type of three installation from an um, on-premise um, server. Um, so you can uh, lift and shift um, to the single server. And, um, but um, the main disadvantages are um, that there is a resource fight between the, between the web server, like an Apache 2 or an, or an Nginx. And with the PHP, the MySQL the database is running on the system and um, maybe in a Redis for sessions and a Solar for the search. Um, all these components are fighting um, for the resources, the CPU and the memory, and that's an approach um, which is not very um, comfortable, uh, comfortable for um, hosting a web application. Um, so the advantages of the setup um, are the simple installation of type of three, um, you have a simple maintenance, um, you only maintain a single server, you can log in, um, change the configuration, re restart a service or install a new components. It fits low traffic sites, um, it's very cost efficient um, and you can um, also uh, deploy it to AWS, Azure, um, the Google Cloud Platform and on-premises. Uh, the disadvantages um, are you have critical utilization during jobs, uh, such as rebuilds or other jobs, or if one service um, runs on high load, um, it affects the other services um, which are running on the single server. Um, we have many limitations for adding new services um, because you have to scale up the single server, you have a downtime um, when you add some other components like in Redis or in Varnish um, or something like else. And, you are missing the elastic elasticity. Um, so if you get higher load, um, the server um, can't serve uh, the requests and um, the website is offline. And yeah, it's not the, not the best uh, approach for that. Um, a better solution for that is um, decouple the components. Um, so you don't have the um, RDS or the, the database running on the single server. Um, and the database um, is decoupled in a single service, um, which is called RDS um, on AWS. And for example, if you're using an AWS Aurora, um, you have the replication uh, in place and uh, you don't uh, have to do anything, just switch on the um, replication and uh, AWS does some magic and you have a uh, failover in place, which is um, automatically, automatically switch over um, if um, the primary fails in um, the data center. Um, but we, at the moment, we also have 
the single server in place and the single server um, at this moment is a bottleneck and if it fails um, the website goes down and um, that's no good for, for us. The next step uh, we can provide uh, in the cloud um, is we can play as a, we can place a second EC2 instance beside um, our running EC2 instance um, as a failover. So we have the failover for the database and we have the failover for the EC2 instance in place. But um, in this case, we have to sync the whole data um, which are stored on the EC2 instance like um, like the code base, the media files, uh, and so on to the um, to the other, to the failover EC2 instance. Um, so these two instances are in sync. Um, and if the primary instance fails, um, we can switch to the failover instance. This is in this uh, simple setup done by a DNS switch to the um, EC2 instance in failover mode. And you have a short downtime, um, but you can keep running um, the type of three. The next step is we are doing a redundant setup with an AWS load balancer in front of that. And now if one instance fails, um, the other instance um, does the job and um, the website is still online. At the load balancer, we can also place SSL certificates, which are free for um, for AWS customers. Um, so in this case, we also have a uh, secure um, SSL connection, uh, HTTP connection, um, which terminates at the load balancer and uh, doesn't get any resources from the EC2 instances. And yeah, but um, in this case, we also have to sync the files from the EC2 instance to the other EC2 instance to keep them in sync. Uh, we have to store the sessions in the database, so the sessions are in sync. Um, it's a better approach than the single server. Um, we are more decoupled, and yes, we have the basic component isolation in this case. We have a redundant setup, we have a better spread of resources, and we have the possibility to increase the redundancy by adding a second, uh, a third, or a fourth um, EC2 instance. Um, but uh, we have to keep in mind that we have to um, hold them in sync, um, which is uh, much more effort um, than with two instances. So in this case, we need a multi-server deployment. Um, we, um, we have also the monolithic approach uh, still, and um, we have a more complexity, uh, complexity of type three infrastructure, um, which we have to maintain um, than a single server. And we have the restricted scalability, so we have to uh, scale up um, the, the server uh, manually, so there is no dynamic scaling or something like else. Okay. So then we have the possibility to add an auto scaling group um, as as a um, as a front end. And in this case, we have very much um, elasticity in the front end and in the database tier. And we have the replication uh, at the database, so with a failover. But in this case, um, we need a deployment for every instance. So when a new instance scale in, um, we have to um, provision the instance, we have to deploy the code base. And uh, we do. Uh, we have to do some checks um, if the instance is healthy. So if there um, are no problems with the web server, with the PHP, um, or something like else, then we need a shared folder um, for keeping um, persistent data um, between the um, between every uh, between the EC2 instances in the auto scaling group. And we need a Redis um, for the sessions um, to keep the sessions in sync between the EC2 instances. But in this case, um, we can react. So not we, but the infrastructure automatically react um, for request peaks uh, at request peaks. 
and um, we can scale um, with some metrics like the CPU utilization on the server, the CPU load, or the requests uh, which are routed to the um, single EC2 instances. Um, this is a much better better proof um, than a single server um, which with uh, sharing resources. So at the moment we only have um, the PHP and the web server running on the EC2 instances um, and we don't have to um, run a separated software for, for the sessions like the Redis, which is um, the Elastic Cache service from AWS, which is a managed service from AWS, and um, we don't um, keep it running. Um, that's a part of AWS um, who, uh, which maintains the server. Um, the shared folder in this case is an EFS, it's the Elastic File System, which is mounted to uh, the single instances, and on this folder, um, you can uh, you have to uh, place um, the persistent data uh, like the type of retemp folder with the assets or the file admin to keep the files in sync. Okay. Then we have an auto scaling tier for the front end, and I think it's a good idea to do some auto scaling um, for the databases. Um, so we have an Aurora cluster in this case. And there we have a primary, um, which is the writer endpoint in this case, and we have different readers. Um, one of them is a failover reader if the um, primary writer fails. And then we can add several, um, RDA, uh, several reader instances, um, or we can enable an auto-scaling um, reader setup, which reacts on the load um, of, the, of the database. And now we are um, prepared for higher loads um, with no manual uh, configuration um, while, um, um, while request peaks are hitting the environment and it's more durable um, for running the type of three in that case. At the end, on this uh, small journey, um, we are ending in an enterprise architecture. Sorry for the small, um, for the small um, fonts uh, I used here. Um, in this case, you see an enterprise setup which is running on uh, several projects of us. Um, this person in front of it, it's the user, and this enterprise architecture offers you the most performance, redund redundancy, and um, also cost effectiveness. effectivity. Um, but um, yes, about cost, um, we will talk later. Okay, then we have a CDN in place, which is um, the CloudFront uh, service from AWS, um, which we can use as a full page cache for, um, for Type 3, um, or only for the media files, um, which are routed through this separated endpoint, um, for example, with a media um, URL, um, or with a path-based um, um, caching in front of the load balancer. Then we have a web application firewall um, to do some security. Um, I will talk about it later. And here we can see we are, um, deploy the infrastructure into availability zones. So at AWS, um, we have many regions, for example, um, EU Central 1, um, this is uh, Frankfurt am Main, and um, for example, US, uh, US West 2, um, which is Oregon, which is the, which is the Oregon uh, region in uh, USA. And um, the instances and the um, resources are spread um, over these two availability zones um, for higher uh, redundancy. And yes, and we also have the Redis uh, cluster here uh, redundant. And we also have a backend server um, which is um, accessible by um, a path-based routing or um, host-based routing with a subdomain for the uh, type, of, type of 3 website, which is in place at the load balancer. And we um, have a solar app server here, um, which um, is provided, uh, for example, by us. And we have the um, NFS, um, which is the EFS service uh, from AWS. And we have the, um, the Aurora in the back end as a database tier with a primary and a secondary 
uh, also called a writer and a reader. And then, um, as you have uh, seen before, uh, we can also add um, the auto scaling in the cloud for the database without any downtime or something like else. In this case, in this setup, we are also able to um, scale up. Um, or change um, configurations of the uh, of every single instance without any downtime, uh, which is um, a very um, big effort, um, big um, 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 uh, I don't know the word, <laughs> uh, which is which is very cool um, in the cloud, and um, the same is for for the backend server. Um, so we can place a second backend server and switch it over all with the solar, and. Yeah, so at the end, um, it's like a microservice approach. Um, we have the dedicated resources um, which we can provision as needed. So every single resource um, can provision at any time uh, without any downtime. It's highly redundant and we have the security best practice. The whole setup um, is placed in a VPC in a virtual private cloud which is an encapsulated cloud um, in the AWS cloud um, for you. And um, we have some security groups and network um, access lists uh, in place, which are the basic security configurations um, for hosting and infrastructure on AWS. Um, but the disadvantages are it's in complex infrastructure. Um, we have complex infrastructure monitoring in place. Um, so you have to um, do um, a very, um, very high effort um, for monitoring um, the infrastructure. Um, we have an, a bigger operational invest. And um, yes, it's an advanced knowledge needed um, for deploying um, this enterprise IT architecture. But I think um, the disadvantages uh, stand in front of the, uh, the advantages. Advantages uh, stands in front of the disadvantages, and um, it's a it's a very uh, cool setup. On the next um, side, we have the security in the cloud. Um, so. AWS have an approach which is called the shared responsibility model. Um, there is AWS, um, which is responsible for the cloud. So the infrastructure running the cloud um, for the core services of the cloud and the customer is responsible for the security in the cloud. So if you're building your, your infrastructure on AWS, you are responsible to secure this infrastructure and um, AWS gives you some guidelines for securing the infrastructure, um, but you have to do it by your own. The next step is encrypt traffic and volumes. Um, it's very easy with the um, free certificates provided by AWS, uh, which you can place on the uh, on the load at the load balancer. And you can also encrypt the volumes. Um, the cool side on AWS is you can um, enable an account wide uh, encryption for EBS volumes, um, like for um, database instances or for uh, single EBS volumes. Um, so they are um, built encrypted automatically and um, you can't forget to encrypt the volumes. You can encrypt the S3 buckets um, or the EFS. Um, so the every data of you is uh, automatically encrypted at rest on AWS in the data centers. The next cool uh, service is, uh, security, is uh, AWS Guard Duty, uh, which uh, do some security scans for you, and it continually is, um, monitor uh, monitors um, for malicious uh, activity, unauthorized behavior, and protect your cloud environment. Um, for example, um, several customers of us um, have uh, a Guard Duty enabled, and um, we are. Um, alerted, um, for example, for um, IP addresses, um, which are um, requested um, from inside uh, the EC2 instances and um, several other um, 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 behaviors, um, like if there is a uh, CVE or something like else. Then in front of um, the, the load balancer or at the load balancer or at the CDN endpoint, you can also um, 
deploy an AWS Web Application Firewall, um, which, which does some um, basic um, security in front of your resources, so in front of your application servers, and um, there are no resources um, used from your application servers, um, um, but um, on the load balancer. And um, the WAF application firewall um, with the security automation, um, which are provided by AWS, um, are checking um, as, uh, are checking the request for SQL injections, um, for uh, cross-site scripting um, attacks, for um, HTTP flooding. So if there's a DDoS attack or something like that, you can um, very simple adjust um, request limits for five minutes, um, which are allowed for um, single IP addresses. Um, it's a scanning continuously for scanners and probes. Um, it uses um, public IP reputation lists for blocking requests. And it also provides a honeypot um, for bots um, which are um, accessing, which are trying to access your cloud infrastructure. So it's a small um, journey to the security of the basic security um, we are provide to our customers um, on AWS. Um, but what about the costs? Um, is the cloud expen expensive? It depends. So um, I have a small example for you um, how you can save costs by choosing um, different uh, CPU architectures. Um, for example, um, if you're using an, an um, EC2 instances with eight vCPUs, um, 60 gig of memory, and we have a network um, um, bandwidth with uh, 10 gigabits, um, then we are at uh, $283 at, um, at, uh, on an Intel CPU. If you're using an AMD uh, CPU, um, we are at 250 euros. And if we are using the new Graviton instances on AWS, we are at $226, um, dollars, um, which is much cheaper um, than the Intel instances. Um, this is an example for on-demand instances um, on AWS. Um, but you have to keep in mind um, that uh, running an AMD instance um, um, for, um, for an uh, Intel instance is a no-brainer, but if you're using ARM instances, um, your software, um, uh, your web server, and your uh, PHP um, has to run on this server, um, because, um, uh, is, uh, have to uh, be able to run on this server because it's a different architecture. Then we have a uh, next option um, for saving cost in the cloud. Um, we can deploy a scheduled scaling. Um, so in the working hours, um, the whole infrastructure um, scales up. Um, the resources are there for, um, for compute the request, responding and um, keeping um, the site up. And at the night, um, the whole infrastructure um, scales down to a minimum of resources uh, for saving the costs. Um, in the night and in the morning, everything uh, scales up. Then we have another cool thing for saving costs uh, in the cloud, um, which is called um, the predictive scaling. Um, we are deploying it um, on several customers um, for their EC2 instances. Um, with predicted scaling, AWS um, takes uh, historical uh, monitoring data of the, um, of the instances, like the CPU usage, um, or you can do it by requests and other metrics. And based on these uh, requests, AWS creates forecasts uh, on which uh, the infrastructure um, is scaled up or scaled down um, without, um, without any manual um, without any manual doings uh, or configurations. It's just a click and it's in place. Then we have further um, options for saving costs, um, which are saving plans and reserved instances. AWS says um, you can save up to 20 uh, to 72% uh, percent of the cost um, by um, guarantee um, the usage of an instance, um, for example, for three years. And um, then, you get in, then you can 
can get a discount um, for um, for seventy two percent. But it's um, what AWS marketing says. Um, another approach is using spot instances. Spot instances are um, server which are in a, in a big pool. And um, when you're running a stateless application, like an auto-scaling group is a type of three, um, then you can uh, use uh, spot instances, um, which are added um, in load situations. And um, these instances um, can can terminate can terminate it uh, can be terminated by AWS at any time um, with with an uh, with one minute um, with a notification one minute before. And but these instances are up to 90% um, cheaper than on on-demand instances. As that says AWS. Um, we saw um, that these instances are um, um, maybe 60% um, cheaper than uh, on-demand instances on AWS. Okay, so that was a small journey um, through hosting AWS on uh, through hosting uh, Type Three on AWS. And um, if you have any questions, um, just write them now or um, get in touch with me at uh, timo.himschett at root360.de. So if you have any questions, now we have time for it. So we have four questions now. So for a non-e-commerce page, um, what's the overhead in pricing if everything is expensive usage based on AWS compared to a single server without thinking about the cloud benefits like availability. Um, yes, it depends. Um, if you're using, um, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, Yes, I think um, for a single server, um, it's it's um, it's it's cheaper running on on premise um, than on running in AWS. Um, when I when I understand the question correctly. <laughs> so next question. Are there key advantages of using AWS over any other cloud, or it's more that you have choose AWS because it's most used? Did you check the uh, Gaia project or Jonas packages and compare it to AWS? Yeah, I choose AWS um, because we are an AWS native hoster, and we um, yeah we see other um, yes we see the other cloud projects, um, but. Um, for our use cases and with our knowledge, and we are also certified for AWS, um, therefore we are using um, AWS. But um, that's not the key that the other projects are, yes, not usable for it or something like that. There are several projects running on Azure or um, the Google Cloud project. Um, I know some projects running on Jonas, and um, we also checked uh, the Gaia X project. Um, at the end, um, it's sometimes a personal preference um, where you want to run your um, project. So if you um, have some trouble maybe with a, with a, um, with a USA um, in the back of AWS, um, then you maybe have to choose an, um, a project which is located in Germany or something like else. But um, uh, from the um, GDPR side, um, hosting on AWS is no problem and yes, it's it's also a personal preference. Okay, the next question. Pooh, <laughs> how how would you rate the cloud readiness of Typho three compared um, to other web app frameworks? Um, Yes, um, 
At Route 360, um, we are running uh, several Type 3s and, um, for example, Shopware, Spryker, Magento um, in the cloud. Um, but it depends on the developers. Um, on the base, there is um, you can run every project in the cloud. And on our customers, we don't have um, very, um, very much um, problems from um, which are based on the infrastructure or um, based in the framework for running them in the cloud. Um, you have to keep in mind the simple things are um, storing the sessions uh, not on the single servers. So the load balancer um, um, split, uh, spread the um, request um, with round robin um, method to the single servers and well, the sessions are stored on one server for uh, one request and then you can Again, uh, then you um, um, get to another server, the session is not stored on this server, then it's not stored and they are not in sync. So if you're using a Redis, uh, you solve the session problem. Then um, you have to keep in mind to choose a shared folder, which is mounted and sim linked in the release um, for the persistent files. And then you are almost ready for the cloud when you then using a um, database service um, which is separated, decoupled from the application instances, um, and then you don't have any problems. So how does the performance behave? Are there any performance losses compared to a classic setup due to the architecture? Yes, it depends. Um, if you host um, all services on a single um, single instance, um, there is a, yes, there is a, um, the smallest um, latency um, between the single services. But um, if you're using an, a cloud server and a cloud architecture, um, then you have um, a little bit higher latencies, um, but they are not um, um, recognizable um, in the front end. So if we're using, so we are um, deploying um, hundreds of customer projects and there are around about um, some projects um, with um, 20 milliseconds until um, 60 milliseconds um, while serving um, the, the, um, the websites, the web applications. Yes. So at the moment, um, I have no other questions. Ah, another question. Do you deploy your code in Docker-like images or deploy it in some SCP way like zipping, deploying, unzipping? Um, both are um, a little bit correct. So we are deploying also ECS uh, cluster on AWS. And so there we deploy images um, which are um, provided by our customers. So our customers are able to deploy um, the images by um, their own. Um, but um, for, the, for the main part of our customers, um, we're using um, normal on-demand instances um, where the application runs natively on the instances and we, are, uh, we have an um, own deploy deployment um, which, we connect, which we can connect to um, a CI CD pipeline of our customers um, or at, uh, on a Git repository or an S3 bucket and then the code um, is taken from the, from the customer sources and um, is uh, deployed to the um, single service by using, um, for example, rsync, git, um, and so on. Are there any key advantages of this AWS architecture over a Kubernetes cluster? <laughs> um, yes. Um, I heard there are some Kubernetes cluster running uh, on production, um, but um, managing a Kubernetes cluster in production is um, a little bit, I think a little bit more difficult um, than running um, architectures um, like the ones we provide uh, to our customers um, because we have a much um, simpler monitoring and they're more durable and um, resilient. Um, and 
We don't deploy a Kubernetes cluster. Um, for that, we are using um, Kubernetes, um, not, not Kubernetes. Uh, we are using um, ECS um, on uh, EC2 instances or um, ECS with Fargate instances. How do you set up your deployment of type of 3 code updates in the auto scaling setup, changing IP addresses of instances and so on new instances? Um, Yes, um, the code on our infrastructures is not um, deployed by us. Um, we are providing um, the mechanics um, of our deployment and the customer are able to deploy by, the, by themselves. Um, we um, um, provide them um, the usage of some um, files, bash files, um, which are run, uh, which are run um, while deploying on the single instances. And on these single instances, um, the code um, is placed in a, in a different folder. Then uh, you can run, the, our customers can run some checks or like Composer or anything else on the single instances. And if everything um, um, finished successfully on the instances, um, there's a single symlink switch. And um, then we um, provide some um, possibilities to for to our customers um, for gathering um, all IPs of the um, EC2 instances, so um, the uh, the customer can reach, um, uh, for example, with a best script um, every um, running um, EC2 instance um, by using our uh, helper scripts. Yes, and um, if a new um, if a new instance is born, um, like an out in an auto scaling group, um, the whole deployment um, not the whole deployment, um, but um, the buffered release in our infrastructure is um, then um, finally is then deployed um, to the single inf in a single instance on uh, on the auto scaling group. Um, you can also use an, an golden army um, for that, uh, a pre-baked army. So there is uh, the whole release in this um, army. It's an Amazon machine image, um, which is um, the base for an EC2 instance, for example. Um, it's like, and um, then you can uh, then the instance come up with a release, and uh, you have all um, code already on this instance. So the last question. Um, which type of three follow type of three type of three comp file is organized in which volume image? Um, I showed it in the uh, in the presentation. Um, uh, the file admin is um, stored on the EFS, uh, for example, um, or the type of three uh, temp uh, folder with the assets and so is also stored on the EFS, and the other folders um, have to be stored on the um, EC2 instance itself. But it depends on the installations and plugins um, which are added by our customers. Um, in that case, um, we have to um, enable some other symlinks to the mount points um, so um, they can persist um, their files on the, um, on the shared folder. OK, then thanks for your questions and um, have a good time. <laughs> Bye. Give it a shot. Our next speaker is uh, Felicity um, and she's from Australia. So 
Um, we figured that if she wanted to do the session right now live, it would be like 1.30 in the morning. Um, and we figured that would be too early for her. So um, the session is pre-recorded. But you can still keep the questions coming because we have the man himself, El Presidente, Olivier Dobakau, ready to do the Q&A later. So thank you, Olivier, for jumping in. And the next session is about this thing. It's about the Title III guidebook, how it came into play, how the entire idea was formed, etc. And I'm really, really keen on uh, getting some more insights on that. So Felicity will take it away after this uh, segue to our sponsors. G'day everyone, my name is Felicity Brand and today I'm going to be talking to you about the Typo 3 Guidebook. This is a pre-recorded session. I'm in Melbourne, Australia and during the time of this event I am going to be asleep. So thank you to the wonders of technology. So for those of you who have not yet purchased your copy of the book, I will tell you a little bit about what's in it. We'll go for a tour. I also want to share with you the interesting and unique story about how we wrote the book. And we'll also touch on what we're doing now, uh, some activities around the book. My fellow authors and I, work for a company called Open Strategy Partners, which we abbreviate to OSP. If you hear me say OSP, I'm talking about Open Strategy Partners. Heather McNamee, Jeffrey A. Jam Maguire and myself. We at OSP work with, we do a lot of work with the Typo3 Association and the Typo3 GmbH. So you may have seen us around before. We are all also members of the association. Um, you might see Heather over in the content team. You can catch me over in the documentation team. And you can hear Jam's dulcet tones on application, the Typo3 podcast. We are also at the moment working on the writing and style guide for typo 3 so we are everywhere you want to be right now and we 
we're happy to be here. First and foremost, where can I buy the book? At any good bookstore. And now in the Typo 3 shop. And I noticed that at the moment in the Typo 3 shop, there are no reviews. So please leave a review. Who knows, if you are the first, maybe you win a prize. All proceeds from the sale of the book go back into the association. So um, know that you are supporting your community. Buy it, share it, review it, enjoy. I'm using this slide throughout my presentation as a not so subtle, not so subliminal message um, because we really want to get this message out there. So next, let's take a little tour. The guidebook is in two parts. It starts with four chapters and part two has 10 hands-on guides. We really wanted to meet the needs of a variety of readers who are coming to the book. So the idea is that it contains everything that newcomers need to know to get started with Typo 3. Um, yes, we do already have a couple of books out there um, for Typo 3 developers, um, such as we've got the Typo 3 x base book and um, the Certified Integrated Study Guide, both by Michael Shams. So this book fills in a gap for those who are new to Typo 3. It lays a foundation for future books to delve into niche topics uh, in more depth without having to cover that foundation all over again. Um, as well, I want to point out that the book um, doesn't compete with existing resources. It sits comfortably among existing resources that we have. So it doesn't uh, seek to compete or supplant what we've already got. So it um, links out to the official documentation, our websites, Slack channel, um, other supporting material that we have. Okay, let's talk about what's in the book. I'm not going to give everything away because we still want you to purchase it, um, but I will walk through each of the four uh, major chapters in part one just to give you an idea and hopefully a bit of a taste so that you are encouraged to buy it. Um, if not for yourself, then maybe for your staff or colleagues, friends. Um, okay, and so I don't remember everything off by heart that's in the book, so I'm actually going to refer to the book to talk you through these. The showroom is the first chapter and that is a showcase for the benefits and features of Typo 3. We do a bit of an unboxing, so we talk about what you get as part of Core uh, without any um, uh, third party extensions, um, so kind of what's in the box. We talk about what you can build with Typo 3. So we have several case studies in there from real organizations and how they use Typo 3 as part of their everyday implementation. Um, and so that's really good because we chose a few different perspectives to give a bit of a view of, yeah, the different ways you can use the CMS. Uh, we talk about the project and the ecosystem. And by that, I mean kind of the architecture of the community. So how the Typo3 Association and the GmbH work together, um, the different parts of the community. And we also touch on building your skills. So that's about certification and the other learning resources that are out there. So, you know, we acknowledge that the book is not the only, is not the be all and end all of um, learning Typo3. So we, uh, we show the avenues for different um, paths for learning the CMS. Next up we have designing and planning. You can't do anything without a plan and this chapter um, contains a lot of um, non-Typo3 specific information which makes it really useful for anyone coming to web development. Um, what else have we got in that chapter? We talk about um, 
navigation and the information architecture of the back end and how the back end and front end relate to each other. Visual design and theming. So that's about how you really need to have your visual design um, in place before you even start doing anything with the CMS. You really need to have an understanding of how your site or whatever it is that you're building is going to hang together. In this chapter, we also talk about content management, so it's important for editors. And we touch on um, a multi-site setup and also the multilingual capabilities in the CMS. Um, so that's a really good one. And we have some screenshots of how different languages, uh, um, how you manage those in the back end. Moving on to chapter three, building and extending. Um, this is where we get into kind of the nuts and bolts or the nitty gritty of um, some of those Typo3 specific concepts like TypoScript, Fluid and our extensions. Um, so this chapter, it says, uh, it starts with a bird's eye view. What am I getting myself into? Um, and what am I working with? So that's, we, um, we talk about some of those concepts I mentioned and uh, we do have a supporting glossary in the book which also defines some of those kind of, um, I'm not going to say hard to understand, but um, new, uh, if you're newly coming to Typo3, there is some jargon and some words that you're going to need to know and understand. Uh, we also talk in this chapter about configuring and customizing. So that's where we're really talking about extensions, how they work, um, the extension repository, and then getting started building your own. Uh, and let's see, launching and maintaining. So I'm going to say it, the boring but important stuff. This is where you can find um, information about the release cycle which is really um, you know as many of you know we have these um, long-term releases and the extended long-term support offered by the GmbH which is really important for any uh, people coming to an open source product who may be a bit wary um, or perhaps their bosses are and um, they want that security of having having the support. So, uh, and uh, yeah, so in that chapter we talk about, um, yeah, how the roadmap is quite visible and transparent. Um, we talk about some of the different steps for upgrading, hosting, launching, deploying, that sort of thing. We also talk about um, centralized site management, if you've got uh, multiple sites that you're supporting. Let's see, this chapter also talks about performance and scalability, system and data security, and oh yeah, the service ecosystem. So um, some other services provided by the GmbH like a uh, project report or a project audit. Um, so that is a really meaty chapter. Um, I know I started off by saying boring but important, but um, probably some of the most fascinating parts are in there. And uh, that's probably the go-to chapter for um, any dev who's been assigned, um, assigned the job to look for a new CMS for their company. Uh, probably the first thing they're going to look at are some of those key things in chapter four. Next, we have a series of practical guides. So the guides are hands-on and they're designed to help you get up and running with Typo3. So we have installing, <clears throat> creating and extending. The guides include, include clear learning outcomes and scenarios to give an insight into why you would do a thing as well as the step-by-step -step how. We wanted to make that really useful for readers and give the ability for readers to cherry pick, just dive into perhaps do one procedure 
or all of them. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to those last two guides on the list there. Um, they are probably the most interesting. So I thought we might take a little look. Making Typo 3 successful for your business. At the end of this tutorial, you'll know that certain Typo 3 core features are especially interesting for certain types of clients. And it says, working with Typo 3, your business philosophy itself may become an inbound marketing channel. Intriguing. And the other one, debugging and troubleshooting, that one talks about debugging and troubleshooting PHP, Fluid, TypoScript, and resetting your backend admin password, which is a trap for young players. So we've got some juicy stuff in there, and I really encourage you to purchase the book and have a read yourself. We have a GitHub repo with fully tested code samples for those guides. Our publisher, APRESS, has a code repository for all of the books they publish. So um, here's ours. And thanks to Philippe, Timo and Jörg for testing that code, we do have a couple of errata. So some mistakes were found. I think we have three so far, and those are listed in the repo as well. So if you do run into trouble, I think in um, perhaps chapter six, I think it is, this could be the reason why. There's that message again. All right, let's move on to talking about how we wrote the book. So at OSP, we didn't write this book in isolation. And in fact, when I came on board this project, I'd never even heard of Typo 3. So there's no way I could have written a book about it. Early on, we attended community events. We spoke with lots of people. We conducted interviews and oh, face to face and written interviews. Uh, so we gathered a lot of data and raw information. This project was really born from us working deeply with the community to channel their expertise and stitch it into a cohesive work. So it was a marriage between the community expertise and the tools and processes that we use at OSP. So this is a picture of Jam and overlaid on that is um, a diagram showing our process. So at OSP, we hate the agony of facing a blank white page as much as anyone. So we try to avoid that as much as possible. And our strength is the tools and processes that we have. And that's what we brought to this book project. So we rely on structure and content briefs. We started with an overarching framework for the book. We had an, an, an initial idea for what we wanted each part to look like. So we had our chapter breakdown. Within that, we knew the sections going into each chapter. And then we created a brief for each of those sections. And that gave us scope to work within. And from there, it was a matter of turning to that raw information we had collected from the community and starting to um, build out the story within the framework. From there, we wove it together and before long, a, a book was starting to form. We, we worked in Google Docs, we did a lot of internal reviews and when we were ready we started to work with our publisher. The publisher for the book, APRESS, helped us engage uh, our two technical reviewers, Kai Strobach and Jo Hasenau, 
and we're really pleased and thankful uh, to them for um, their expert review at helping us ensure the technical accuracy of the book and just keeping us honest. So um, a big thank you to them. We also engaged the Typo3 design team. So they're responsible for all of the diagrams and graphics in the book, which really just help um, illustrate and support the text. And it was really important for us to keep all of the work on the book in the community because it really is a community project. And what we have now is an asset for the community that gives back. I mentioned already, all proceeds from the sale of the book go back into the community. So it's a really useful tool for newcomers to the CMS and especially it's going to help international adoption. There's that slide again. What happens now? There's a lot of work that we have done since the publication of the book. Um, we've got a supporting companion website. We've published some articles, so um, some technical articles in PHP magazine, co-founder magazine, T3 Terminal, Techopedia. That's just to help get the word out and try and reach a broader audience. We've appeared on some podcasts. Um, the Deploy Friday from Platform SH was a panel interview. You can go and check that out on YouTube. Um, Jam interviews me on an episode of Application, the Typo3 podcast. And there's a few other writing podcasts that we have lined up from people who are interested in hearing the story about how we wrote the book. Social media. So we recently did a author Q&A on Twitter, which was pretty fun. And we have some, oh yeah, so I'm doing this event, uh, but I'm, I'm also booked to speak at a writing conference in Prague later this year, specifically about the book. And uh, what else have we got? Um, yeah, skill display. So we are in the process of inputting um, chapters and learnings from the Typo3 guidebook into skill display as skill sets. So you can use that in your certification. Uh, so that's really interesting. Here's a quote from Heather. And I'd like to echo her thoughts that um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to channel the community knowledge into a book. I think it's important to talk about the book and the way we made it, you know, for and with a community because it's kind of a unique story and it's really interesting for this new and um, burgeoning field of developer advocacy, DevRel, community management. So working with an open source community to create such a valuable asset for the community and we're channeling the community knowledge um, into something useful to engage newcomers. So um, increasing adoption of an open source project, growing a user base, growing a community, um, those are all really important um, goals and this book is going to help Typo3 achieve that and I think it is interesting for other communities to hear how we did that. If you want to talk about the book, please do so. We use the Typo3 guidebook hashtag on Twitter. And in the Typo3 Slack, we have a channel, Typo3 book. So please do head over there and ask questions or just, you know, tell us how much you like it. And, you know, ideas for the future. Where can we take it from here? If you're planning an event or hosting a meetup, you may be able to access some discounts. So APRIS do offer a discount code for conferences. They've said they can also provide a PDF 
perhaps as a prize for a competition. Um, so do make sure you contact us for a discount if you are going to hold an event. Typo 3's motto, inspiring people to share. You know that saying, I came for Typo 3, I stayed for the community. Um, it's really true for me. I had to cold call or cold approach quite a few members of the community in the early days writing the book. And I was the new kid on the block. And I was overwhelmed by the response and the reception I received. Everyone I reached out to was so responsive and so welcoming and they really did share their knowledge and it just made my job that much easier and it inspired me to give back as well. So I joined the community. I am a proud member of the documentation team and I I'm happy to be part of this great community. That concludes my talk. I understand that someone will be around to answer Q&A after this session, so please do share your questions. Um, you can contact me on the socials and um, thank you for your time today. Hello everyone, um, this is Olivier de Bacau speaking. I am the president of the Type of Sphere Association and uh, you might wonder what has this guy to do with the Type of 3 book? Well, if you um, are lingering around in the library and you happen to see the book and then you can open the book and then you can see that I wrote the foreword for that book. And um, I, I would like to, today I, I was like, ask, hey, Olivier, can you answer some questions uh, uh, around the book? N not, you know, what is on page 23 and why is this the type of script, uh, uh, type of script error uh, when I do type this uh, in my installation? No, it's more about uh, the circumstances of the book. What was the idea behind the book and, and, and why did the Type of 3 Association appear on the cover of the book that is here in the back of my, um, of my uh, room? Um, so um, I've heard and I've seen that there are some more questions. Um, uh, there's some questions already coming up and I was looking here at the, uh, at the video and I see that Jochen has asked a question about um, the, if there's going to be a version or is there going to be an updated version of the book for version 11, 12, 13, 25, whatever. So um, the book currently was written for version was started to be written for version 9 and then version 10 came up and we updated the book to be um, working or to be um, um, working with version 10. Um, so with, all, with books you should always consider that um, there's a certain amount of books that are pre-printed as a first edition and, um, and, and when those, this, um, this um, edition has been uh, uh, has gone out um, out of stock. Uh, usually, the uh, sup, um, the, um, uh, the the uh, well, the A press in that case would come up and say, "Okay, let's do a second edition of the book," um, considering that there might be errors that have we have uh, found out, or that there might be some updates um, that need to be uh, made. Luckily, um, nowadays, or, or the book for the book currently. Um, the book was like um, it's, it can it, it's this is it's distributed worldwide, so you can buy this book everywhere uh, where um, where A Press is having either a shop or delivering to, or you can go to Amazon, you can go to, go to Barnes and Nobles, or you can even go to your local store in, in, in here in Germany, for example, and order it to your uh, um, to your um, local um, bookstore. And um, this book will be printed. Um, maybe on demand. So no wood and no uh, paper is wasted for that book and, and, and this is a very good thing. So we are, um, we are certainly looking forward to do an update of the book, not for version 11, maybe um, in 18 months from that for version 12. Um, so we will see that. Um, you know, there's the website typo3book.com 
where you can go and you can find all the, the questions or you can find like uh, more details about the book but also you can find the code repository for the examples of the book and um, this um, this is like you know with an open source project you can go there and you can request the pub a public um, a PR like a, pub, a pull request so if, if there's code that needs to be updated so also there we, we had people working um, from the community to to uh, to enable um, us with with the uh, with the code um, here so um, the second question and this is like um, a question that um, um, also Johan has been sending in if there's other editions of the book planned in other languages um, this is a very good question um, the editor um, or, or the the publisher of the book we asked them and they said okay we need to prove or we need to show that there's a certain amount of interest for 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 that for for that publishing um, we we will we we have said okay we think it, it would be worth to have a translation in Fr French or to have a translation maybe in in, in, in other languages um, and um, we're in, in, in discussions with them um, if there's enough demand um, that we can prove to the uh, publisher um, they will go and 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 and, and, and ask for a translate for translation costs and then we will go into discussions all right um, um, who, who's paying the translation? Is this something that the Type Three Association um, can 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 do or not? So um, um, so that's the um, one thing. So uh, we have a, um, another question from Alexander uh, Nietzsche. I think you were really having very good questions, just as, as a as a small remark. So this is not pre-recorded. So um, you re you had really cool questions for the AWS um, um, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, further uh, uh, later uh, earlier on so um, so your question is um, and let me just see that I can put here can read it here because I have a, a video with um, the guys in the back office that are like looking and high cast and you're a really cool guy um, so the question is like um, how do you compare this book um, like the book from Michael Champs the certified integrator certified developer and the X space book um, the book is more like an entry level. Um, when I started with Typo 3, so now the grandfather is telling you stories uh, about 20 years ago, um, there was no book. I remember then we went all, everybody went to the snowboard tour. Um, and then out of the sudden, uh, Robert Meyer from Mittwald, he wrote a book, um, Typo 3 for beginners. Germany was Einsteiger. And um, I would compare the guidebook as a mixture of, let's say, a, a, web, a beginner's guide, but uh, also a guide for people that have like advanced um, uh, knowledge. It's not with the other books that uh, you were asking, Alexander. Um, those books are ought to prepare you for the certification so that you, they... Um, um, require a, a more in-depth um, learning uh, and more in-depth um, uh, so the book the guidebook can be read you know you can open it and say oh I'm interested in chapter 5 then you open up and you read it and it's not like there's something in the chapter 5 that is explained in chapter 1 and, and so basically it's it's an it's an entry uh, entry level book um, it's supposed to help you to understand um, where the key concepts of Type 3 um, are. Um, so the question, next question that we have here is, um, will there be a digital version that gets updated automatically once there's a new content? I would think that this will not be the case. There's a, um, you buy a version of the book and I mean that's the publisher's um, um, Pardon? That, that's the part. That's the pu publisher's. Um, um, uh, yeah, I need to 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 lower down the the um, the video the, the sound here. So uh, sorry. Um, so the publisher's uh, model is actually to sell a, a digital copy of the book. Um, they might send you up an update if there's errors in the version that they've sold you, 
but I don't think so that when we will come up with a new edition of the book that you will get a free copy of it. I think that's, that's, that would be too nice. I mean, that would be what we as open sources would actually do, but um, I think we, we have to, to live with that. So um, I think that's um, the last question that we got. Um, so from my side, um, once again, um, if you are, um, if you want to buy the book and you are within, let's say, um, Germany or f uh, France or whatever, um, choose the best way to buy it. Um, you're by yourself. We, we offer this book in the Type 3 shop um, and uh, we would be very pleased to, to, to sell you, you that, but it's, it, you know, it's all about um, what, what suits you best and, 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 and maybe support your local bookstore by buying it. Uh, maybe go to places where, you know, you know, we have Hugen Dubel here in Germany and they are, um, they would pro we would profit from being in the shelf. So, and last but not least, and I, I would uh, re uh, please um, send us a, um, send us a, uh, a review of the book, uh, publish it, um, on the websites you go you go to Amazon and, and, and maybe if you have done so just hint us that you've done this review uh, if you're owning a blog um, pl please blog about the book if you have read it come back with questions um, and so on so with that my closing words are to everybody who has co contributed to the book foremost the members of the type of three association that paid for the book with their membership uh, fees that they are giving to us so big thanks for that because the book was like a two-year effort um, to uh, to do so and um, thanks for that and um, yeah have a great afternoon continue uh, watching I, I will be um, I will be uh, staying around if you have any questions um, so far and, and, and look forward to see you the next time
So welcome back. I personally love the idea of the book. I think it's really helping Type 3 grow uh, internationally. So thumbs up for everybody involved, also the people who participated on their spare time and uh, tried to contribute in whatever they, uh, way they could. It was like huge thank you. Really important that we keep that spirit up. Now for the really, really interesting part if you're into the development of the future. Um, so we have the man, the return of the Mac, so to say, Benny Mac, uh, core team lead and uh, developer in chief, uh, however you want to call him, He's, he, he does so many things, um, has prepared a dedicated session showing you all the new goodies uh, that you have in Table 3 version 11 that helps your editors work easier, streamline processes, um, you know, like polish out those, those, those small dents um, that you might like, dislike, or grown to hate uh, in Type 3's core. So um, we'll have a quick word from our sponsors, and then we'll, write, we'll be right back with uh, Benny Mac. So stay in it. Hello everyone from the headquarters of um, Typo 3 core development. Uh, <laughs> because today uh, the last talk is about Typo 3 version 11 and what's coming up in the next version, the LTS version, the LTS release of the next version will be in, released on October 5th. And along that route we have had uh, quite a few releases already sprint releases and today I want to not talk about you know cool new APIs and things we've changed under the hood because that's what I usually do but today I want to talk about the benefits of um, Type 3 version 11 for editors so and because it's version 11 so I packed up 11 things for you to um, yeah to to look at and um, let's see if you're um, as happy as I am about these features. First, before we dive into these 11 things, uh, let's quickly introduce myself because I'm not at the headquarters of Typo 3 GmbH in Düsseldorf, but, you know, at home basically. Um, still, I do Typo 3 work um, for Typo 3 core most of the time, Typo 3 project lead, and my main job is pressing the release button and 
um, doing the releases, but at the same time, of course, coordinate what others do in the community and, and try to um, to see if um, the one feature doesn't contra contradict the other, et cetera, et cetera. But I also use Typo3. Um, so I do a lot of setting up new Typo3 installations. I, uh, of course, also add content and manage content to Typo3, and I also extend Typo3 through extensions. Because um, I only do Typo3 core development at night, and during the day I work at a company called B13, and at the company B13 we basically uh, work exclusively with Typo3. We run roughly 40 Typo3 projects, um, and what we've been trying to do is we've uh, been using the latest versions as soon as possible. Uh, if, for instance, all the extensions are available, we'll try to, to upgrade because we always see a benefit in that, you know, having latest PHP versions usually brings some performance benefit. Uh, and we also learn a lot about um, the new Typo3 versions and can bring in feedback and make sure we fix bugs. So, of the 40 projects, roughly, that we have um, running, two already are running on version 11, uh, one of the sprint releases, and several projects are already in the planning for the upgrades because October is coming soon, so everybody's enjoying the summer, and then there's the LTS version. But, um, yeah, as mentioned, the, the previous versions were usually around, we've introduced some new APIs, we've introduced this PSR, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for me, version 11 is really for the editors. Um, that means it's, it's meant for, I mean, it's meant for people who actually not develop Typo3 or build, extend Typo3, but actually have to work with the UI. Maybe sometimes, sometimes people say, I have to work with, with Typo3 in the back end, and we want to make life easier for them. Um, of course, the uh, previous Typo3 LTS versions had really, in my opinion, cool things, improvements for the editors. Version 8, we had uh, an RTE and the form framework. Uh, version 9, we had the URL handling built in. Version 10 brought us the dashboard. But for version 11, we thought, hmm, let's take a more bigger scope or a bigger approach for the whole backend UI and not redo everything from scratch because that would be easy because we, then we don't have to um, have to include all the features but we actually took the whole Typo3 backend and streamlined not just the code base but uh, took one module at a time and um, brought in, in, in improvements and to to um, achieve our mission, our goal, to make Typo3 more intuitive, so to use. And so that would be something, imagine you could, hmm, I would say, um, if you have to teach editors how to use Typo3, how cool would it be if you don't have to do that over and over again, but just to cut the time of teaching in half, because it's more intuitive to use, more easy to, easier to use. And um, at that time, at the same time, we also received quite some feedback over the past years that we wanted to include a functionality for editors into Typo3 Core that people have uh, have been waiting um, for such a long time. Um, Typo3 version 11 has so much more than just 11 things um, built in, but um, I mean, there's so many things for editors, uh, for developers, integrators, side admins, but this presentation is just about the editors and about the current state of today of version 11. There are still more things to come. Some things might look a bit different in version 11 LTS, but I think that's totally acceptable. So for me <laughs> now, it's just a sneak peek for you to look into the current state and all the things so our, our mission here was to say, okay, we want editors to say, we want the next version to, to use because it solve, solves so many issues, saves us so much time, instead of um, say that agencies need to convince 
editors or or their their bosses to upgrade. Instead, uh, they can they can show them the what's new slides or maybe a condensed version like this presentation and say, okay, these were the things I've been asking myself, why didn't Typo 3 include this the whole time? And so that's, that's what we did and that's what we're going to look at. So we'll take one thing at a time. The number one thing I want to show you is the page tree. No, we haven't um, rebuilt the page tree from scratch. I mentioned this. But I thought it would be cool to log into version 10 and version 11 in simultaneously and you can see the whole experience right away instead of just uh, looking at screenshots. So let's try this out. This is a version 10 installation. You might see it. Uh, it's a bit, looks a bit dusty. Let's take that, log in, admin, JOH306. You have to wait for logging for a long time. No, okay, let's try admin password. I, th I read this in a book 10 years ago. Also not working. Let's try Benny and password. Oh, there we are. So we're in version 10. At the same time, I have a version 11 backend. Let's try that one, Benny password. And you're already in Typo 3 version 11. So that's easy. Um, of course, if you have the right password, that's no big deal. So I have the introduction package here on the same installation. I upgraded from version 10 to version 11 in two minutes. So it's exactly the same installation. We're doing this live. So there might be bugs. There might be things. We'll see. So I've been talking about the page tree. That's the version 10 page tree. So you have the plus button. It's like a switch with icons and then you can filter for two columns, for instance. You can reload. In version 11, we have the filter right away, always visible. We have um, the drag and drop always vis visible. So there's no switch anymore. Um, at the same time, we also have something you've seen here which is now you can resize it. I have some projects where this might be quite handy because I cannot do this here. And then we have the button to collapse it completely, which is now um, right here instead of somewhere in the top. And the nice thing about that is that it, it saves the current state. So if I uh, expand it fully and I reload the backend, it's still contain or if I log in and log out and log in it has still the same width and height uh, or width of course so I like that personally because it's been annoying for me as well because I also do uh, work with Typo 3 in the back end so that's number one let's see what we have well number one is first the resizing the collapsing and the filtering is always available small things we improved it save some time and makes Typo 3 less uh, complicated, I would say. So number two is the page module. Everybody is using the page module or most of them uh, of the editors. And let's see what changed there. I'll just take a random page. And to be honest, nothing has changed a lot. Uh, much except there's now a button that looks different before we had the bookmarking functionality so we could add a bookmark and then I can you know log in and go back to this page exactly well to be honest this button exists also in other modules but um, we took it up a notch and we ha now have a share button so you can still create the bookmark to this page or copy the URL to this page Oh, by the way, the URL is now quite logically un understandable for my opinion. Instead of this, this page now has, um, yeah, a speaking URL. Let's let's put it this way. Um, and if I copy that URL, send it to a colleague. This person could log in and 
comes back right exactly to this page. So I really like that feature. Um, that's the current state of the page module. There's more stuff to come for version 11 LTS. Um, and the sharing is, of course, not bound to the page module. You can even do that with editing records, etc. So let's get a bit into the details. There are some people who have asked for such a feature or for these changes for, I don't know, five years at least. Um, but to understand that feature, we need to explain what the element browser is. So let's take um, any regular content put a um, hmm, menu of pages to it, and then you can select a page here. So I want to, what is this? So I have to understand, what, there's so many play buttons here, I don't know what that means. Um, and then there's a plus here, etc. cetera. Um, oh, I selected a page, okay. Um, maybe I want to select, and oh, yeah, I selected another page, but I also can click the play button. Ah, I see. So now I understand that and can select a page out of that list. Okay, understood that. I can save it. So that's, that's the element browser, which we also have available when you browse through news or try to search, search for news, search for a page like this. There's no page called Benjamin text maybe. Oh, there's text. Okay, um, and that's that's basically the so-called element browser or record selector. And the record selector, if you noticed here, has um, kind of looks different to whatever page tree we have here. So let's try the same thing. Um, we add regular content. We chose a um, menu of sub-pages, select the record select. Oh, I have to search in here as well. I can even resize. I can collapse, which is nice if you have a lot of things. And now we have the CSS bug, you know, we need to fix. But uh, everything else is super fast because um, one thing you might notice, if I scroll down, click on media, first of all, if I hover, I get the link directly to this one. But if I click on the uh, element itself, I'm directly, um, seeing the sub pages or whatever records I want to select, news, etc. And it's, I think it's much more clearer than the so-called play button to understand what's going on here. But um, the whole tree, I mean, the, we've also streamlined the search bars or search filters, but the tree is still always the same. The collapsing is done through Ajax. Um, it's not jumping up and down. You might not have noticed, but if I re-click here, I'm still up there. If you have more than, let's say, 200 pages, you might be in trouble. So this one saves you quite a lot of time because you don't have to scroll down and up again. Or you can search for text, and then you get directly to that page. I want to link to that one. Boom. You can view the changes too. Anyway, you could have done this in version 10. That's the so-called element browser and the page tree in the element browser. The cool thing is because it's the same technology, it keeps the state of the items you have opened in the regular page tree within the element browser as well. So now we've talked about the page tree, element browser, page selecting thing, but um, there's the so-called page link handler. Imagine you set a link to a page, which sometimes happen if you do cross-linking. So let's get back to some random other page. Let's add some content with just regular text. Hello, this is a text element for version 10. So now we have the same tree as the other one. There's no filter. If you, you might have seen that, it jumps back up again because it doesn't keep the state really and there's so many lines. Um, so then I want to maybe directly link to a content element 
instead of um, something else, uh, maybe the play button. Yeah, the play button was the right one. Cool. I want to link to this page. Perfect. And now it's selected. This is, has some shiny green in it. And this is somehow other selected differently. So how does that look like in version 11? Let's add some regular text. This is super fast, by the way, because We've also changed some stuff under the hood, but that's a topic for another day. We still have, of course, not just in the record browser, but also in the link browser, um, the, the tree as from the regular page, which collapses with Ajax. I know it's old school, but we can also link directly to this page. Or if I want to link to a content element, I click either on search. Oh, I can link to that search page, or I can use that button or I can link to a content element. We feel like this is less complicated than, you know, understanding when to link to it, no double click or whatever, which is complicated because you accidentally clicked on double click. And also, by the way, um, the whole additional attributes for a link, like the target or an additional CSS class, is now moved um, from the top to the um, right side because then we have more space for the tree, which is nice. Oh, and of course, you can also uh, collapse this one. You can resize it and it saves its state as well. That's the page link handler. Maybe you've learned something new um, because there are three page trees, three page trees. So one huge change we've done visually f is the list module. So we went through not just this uh, linking pop-ups layers, but we also looked at the list module. So there are some things maybe you don't know yet about Typo3, but the power users know that. If you're on a page for subpages, you can list the pages. You have other records in there. There's a plus icon. I believe you can add a record here. Then you have dot, dot, dot. Oh, something goes up. Let me see, what is that hide record? Thing? What is this? Uh, this okay, mm -hmm, I got it. What do we have here? Whoa, we have a lot more buttons. I don't know what these means. Move this page, okay. Um, this is a lot of icons. If I use the extended view, I get these icons all along and I have icon hell. If you prefer this view, um, you must be really advanced for this, um, this tool called Typo3. And on top, you could even go into the um, single table view. You can download this whole page, uh, uh, this, these records as a CSV file. Um, you can also show more fields if you scroll back and then edit the subtitle for all these fields. Well, well it's nice. Now, now we have a lot of icons here. <whistles> and uh, this might be a bit complicated. Also, mind the search, which jumps up and down. Um, you can do that. Or we let's have a look at version 11, because we've done a couple of different things, and we're not at the end. First of all, you might, as, you might have noticed uh, some styling issues with the clipboard or changes with the clipboard and uh, the, the toggles. But also, uh, each table now has a download button and a show columns button. And the new record button has been lifted. So if I change new columns and I also want to um, show the subtitle, I can do that now, I can check, uncheck, toggle, and have that available here. Um, and then the extended view button is gone because We've in decided to use a so-called additional menu for it. And with that, we have more space to explain these icons because then I, I don't have to hover over all the icons again and understand what they do. So that's quite nice to, to hit the right spot. So there's so much more in the uh, list module. Let's say download. You can download the 13 records, either the ones you've just uh, selected or all the records. You want the records shown uh, with English or the, the IDs, 
can export them as JSON file if you want to, or CSV, and um, we also want to include um, more options to, uh, or a hook so that extensions could actually create uh, Excel exports. So we like that feature that it's built in right away. Um, and of course, in the very end, the list module is much faster than in version 10 because we've also found a lot of unneeded database queries, so it should be faster. There's no percentage, but at least we have we have a, we know that we've optimized a lot of things. <laughs> the more data you have, the faster or the the performance gain will be bigger. So then there's the info module. Who's what's what's with the info module? Info module gives you some information about log page tree overview, which is nice because you could filter and see all this, the, the URLs for these pages and subpages. Um, and some things look similar and some things look a bit different because we now also have a small thing called layouts to see what actual layouts we have used for that is resolved for this page and the ones that is selected and you can actually change the layouts right away. The backend layouts and the frontend layouts depends on your setup. Um, this overview, this information module is quite helpful if you deal with an installation that you just need to get an overview with what's wrong or need to have support for. So um, I think these tiny small things are really nice and we also have a couple of more ideas for multilingual in the info module. Um, and let's put it this way, we still have a couple of more weeks to improve that module and to add new functionality. The redirect module, hmm, I know a lot of people um, complain when they have larger installations. Um, there's no redirect. Let's add a redirect. Oh, that's nice, the page tree. We'll just add a random redirect. And um, you could a even filter now, I, ha I don't have that s uh, enabled unfortunately, to uh, filter um, here for redirects that haven't been hit so if you do, if you activate the redirect tracking, you have the possibility to say, "Hey, um, I added this redirect, but it was never, um, it was never used. Um, so maybe we can just get rid of it, um, and we can actually sort this, and you have an, a better overview in the redirects module." But um, unfortunately, the live demo cannot show you that because it's a brand new installation. And yes, we still need permission handling here. If anybody's up for the task, um, let me know, because that would be a really cool feature. So number eight, the file tree, or maybe the folder tree, I don't know. You can access it through the file list module. So it's basically like a Windows Explorer style thing. And um, it's based on code that I've written 2006, uh, and it's still working. And it just doesn't look like this other tree because it's in an iframe. It doesn't have a filter and um, it doesn't have, well, it, it, oh, it does have drag and drop, but you just don't see it. So in version 11, we decided to just use the same technology under the hood and just use the same tree for the, f um, the folders because then you can just search for audio and it shows you the folders with audio. But why is it showing content? Well, what happens is it also shows you um, folders where, where there is a file that's called audio. So you could actually search for MP3s and all the MP3s are in audio. It works with everything you, you want to search. Uh, that's basically the file tree. We don't have an iframe anymore and we can get rid of a lot of old code. And so there's a win, 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 win situation for everybody. And most importantly, editors um, can finally use this properly and the whole backend, not just the page tree, 
but also the file or folder tree look the same. There's the file list that we've seen, um, and I also want to uh, quickly dive into that because that's that's the file list in version 10. There's some buttons here. Okay, I think that's going up a thing. There's an extended view. Yeah, buttons. Whoa. So that's buttons, and there's no extended view because we also have the same functionality now as in the list module. Um, less options because most of the time these buttons are on at the very very bottom, and it's very hard to understand. Um, things like display thumbnails is now on top because it it's now it was back there down there. Um, the search looks exactly the same as the other search fields and the buttons have labels because now I understand that this one means upload files. Let's do that really quickly. Upload a couple of files. Let's upload a couple of files here. Some errors here, some errors here. Okay, I can deal with that right now. I have a lot of error messages and all the files are available under images. The difference here is that if you use the search, for instance, to search for a file called Hutomo, that this view, we are still working on that view, now comes from the same code base as this view. You notice that some things don't work, like um, putting something on the clipboard or pasting something in the clipboard does not work really here. Um, and we fixed all the issues because it's the same view over and over again and we only need to fix bugs once. Um, that's the file list. We also have quite some plans in here. Um, we liked that the options are more visually um, clear because extended view is something that everybody who who works with Repo3 knows for for quite some time, but newcomers just need to play around and try their way out. But then we also have the file link handler. Well, by now you might know how the file link handler looks like because in version 10, let's take version 10, we go into this um, thing we link to a file. Whoa, what is this? Ah, yeah, right. Oh, there's files. There's a file. Oh, there's a typo 3 bug. Let's take this one. Let's link to a typo 3 bug. And how can we do that here? File. Oh, we also have the tree. We also have the filter. We could also search for bug. All right, it's in images. And it's more obvious that this structure looks a bit cleaner. We also want to streamline these views to get some more metadata in there. But um, comparing this view with this one, I think um, we can take this as a winner. Uh, we still lack a search here for the files within the folder and pagination, which I think would be really cool. But at least um, it's visually more streamlined to linking to a page, for instance. Same goes to uh, linking to a folder because you can li link to a folder either by using this icon again or just selecting a subfolder in here. That's the file link handler. So you see we just took the same concepts and brought it across the whole Typo3 backend. We also have the, the Ajax-based loading of the contents of the folder. So not the whole tree gets reloaded and you can also use the tree without the play button. Then we also have the file selector, number 11, last feature. That's m That might be something that most of you know. If you edit the page properties, for instance, um, you can add resources, create new relation. Great, let's connect it to some images. Uh, oh, I I actually wanted to add a couple of them. Uh, plus. Oh yeah, you can use plus. You can also use this. And then if you know what you're doing, I know what I'm doing. 
you can click oh that was the wrong ah oh, crap we had these two then you can click on import selection so you know, there's a search too nice uh, and you have it in there and with version 11 we came up with what I think is a more intuitive way because you can you have actually checkboxes up here and uh, the whole row gets selected we, st we in this place we actually have some metadata so th this is the stuff that we want to streamline search and the display thumbnails functionality is exactly the same and you can click here uncheck check all toggle selection depends on what you want to do and import it and that's version uh, version 11 at least feature or topic 11 um, so if you think that's it um, it's not everything there there's still some things we want to uh, improve for site admins so people who actually are administrators in the type of three backend and for these kind of things we want to um, we thought about um, rethinking the file mounts so file mount is like a folder where you can limit editors to only have access to one specific folder in its subfolders and we added some ways to create them quicker in a quicker way if you rename the folder the file mount gets renamed as well some convenience things that saves time for the site admins um, and adding file mounts is now quicker as well I would give you a demo but the time is up and then we also have uh, some improvements for the backend user module to um, easily manage copy groups and users uh, in a more modern fashion and to streamline it with the user experience that you've seen for version 11 so far for editors so that's it from my side happy version 11 Thanks to everybody who uh, contributed their time, money, um, and thoughts in, t in being a good discussion partner on what to improve. And um, I think that makes this whole version 11 really great because we took a lot of input, but we also, uh, you know, also from the issues, but we also talked to quite some people, and a lot of people um, appreciate it by helping out giving feedback uh, and also giving feedback on implemented uh, implemented features yes so time's up for me here if you have any questions let me know the first question from felix jacobi is is the new page bar able to handle more than eight page types um if you resize it there's more uh, places to do that um, we actually have a ticket to improve that view that you can actually um, navigate through these um, items and to filter them um, but we also are looking into ways to create pages in a better way than just drag and dropping because people have s um, experienced newcomers that they actually click on these icons and think something would happen but they actually need to drag and drop and that's something that's not everywhere in or there's no other place in type of three backend where this functionality happens where you can only do drag and drop and not click I mean these icons look like you could have a context menu open but it, they don't so there's there's teaching and we want to improve that um, we'll see how far we can um, move forward into the page tree bar. The next question is from Stefan Frömken. Is the configured background color for a specific page or page tree also used in the element browser? So um, you've seen the page tree and there's some cool fancy features for super experienced people like Stefan where you can actually um, color the background of a whole section into um, a different background color let's say green is everything that's related to company red is everything related to products or something like that um, and this functionality because we're still using the exact same code bases for all the trees of the, all the page trees it's 
of course, the same background color that you configure. Except for one thing, because um, the Element Browser allows you to show more um, page trees than just the main page tree, because you can do some user TS config options. Um, Felix Jacobi asked the question, is there also a corresponding import button? Um, I don't know the context to that. I think it's related to an export button or to a page tree button. I don't know. So I would need to have a bit more details here. Nonetheless, there's also um, people working on the import and export module because that's also been neglected for quite some time. And I hope we can also see some more editor-related or site admin-related features. Um, Frank Picolin asked the question, is there still a bulk edit function in the new list module? Because it's not a new list module, but an extended or an improved list module, all the bulk editing features still work as the same, the same as before. So there are still tons of buttons. We try to improve that situation, um, but the mass editing, of course, is still there. We wouldn't remove it if we wouldn't come up with. Oh, we would only remove it if we could up, come up, bleep, could come up with a better uh, solution. But we wouldn't drop that feature. Um, coming back to the import button. There's a download table as JSON um, button in the list module. And Felix Jacobi asked if there is also a corresponding import button. And there's no corresponding import button because we would need to have a definition of what people want to achieve. I would say that sounds rather like an import export feature. More questions? No. Um, some last words. I like it. Um, much more than version 10. If I work with Hypo3 in the back end, it feels like it's faster and it's much more fun. Stefan Busemann asked if there's uh, the possibility to link to other language we, via the element browser. Um, his question is, what about linking? Well, that's, it's complicated, let's put it this way. Um, it always depends on your site configuration, at least we have that information, but also on if, if the, a content element has a parent or um, a, a parent in the default language or not, so called uh, free mode uh, content elements, they could show up for content elements. We also want to finally get rid of the hard-coded um, fragment, the anchor link functionality and make it more um, flexible. But I don't think it's going to happen for version 11. But there's an extension called link to language which is compatible with Typo 3 version 9 which has exactly that feature you want. Because I built it last week for a customer who exactly asked the same question. So Stefan, maybe you want to try this extension. It's called link to language. So Jonathan Irulian asked the last question for today. Is accessibility, authoring tool accessibility guidelines, ATAG, taken into account in these new features? Since almost a year, we now have a accessibility team, which is really cool because um, I'm no accessibility expert and the accessibility team, team helped a lot to not just improve these features that we built, but also um, added features th um, or like areas that we both worked on were collaborated uh, or we collaborated on this to improve the situation of the current backend. So not just the parts that you've seen, but also other parts have improved. 
uh, in terms of accessibility. It's not related to these 11 things per se, but quite so quite a lot of features have been um, um, looked into in terms of accessibility. For instance, the access accessibility is looking into most commonly used features like the page module and the list module. Um, they also did so with version 10. So version 10 and 11, we had improvements in accessibility for the um, login area. Version 10 also had the option for the page tree to be used with um, with the keyboard only functionality in the module menu. And because we took that code basis and improved it and made it more flexible, all the functionality that we've seen in version 10 and 11 in terms of accessibility could be extend expanded and we've automatically used all the improvements we've done there. So we take it into account, uh, we talked to the accessibility team, but I'm no um, expert in terms of if how good we are um, with some various accessibility guides and measures. Okay, so that was the last question. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope it wasn't too boring. I hope you're excited as I am to upgrade to version 11 in October or um, at least be happy about using Type 311 at some point in some day. Uh, tell everybody about it and uh, give feedback about the features, what you think and what could be improved. Thanks a lot. So that was the last session for today. I personally love the changes. It's like super easy. Um, I really love how Typo 3 version 11 is shaping up and uh, I'm looking really forward to the final release in October. Um, so that basically concludes the sessions for today. Um, already mark your calendar for the next iteration of the online events. Uh, of the online events, bullshit, of the online days, um, which is iteration four, which will be August 26th. Um, and as usual, a huge, huge thank you to all the sponsors uh, who helped make this possible. Big thank you to all the speakers who got into the technicalities of setting up live streaming stuff um, and are getting used to live production. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I know it's new for all you people, but really, really well done. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on August 26th.